Hello everyone, and welcome again to Nettle, the best platform around for distance learning in business, finance, economics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click that bell notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. Many thanks to our current Patreon supporters and YouTube members for making this video possible, and we'd also greatly appreciate if you consider supporting us as well, so please check the link in the description or click the join button below for more details. My name is Sava, and today we're investigating a key foundational concept in statistics and probability theory, that is binomial distribution, as well as the calculations of its expected value, its mean, and variance. The binomial distribution is used to model how many successes out of a several number of trials you would have if your probability of individual trial succeeding is known and trials are independent of each other. That can sound as quite a mouthful, but let's assume the following. Let's assume that our case is as follows. We've got 20 people that set an exam. Let's say it's some chartered exam, for example, CFA or SCCA, whatever. And each of them has a probability of passing this exam, a probability of succeeding in this exam. Let's assume that students are quite similar in terms of their ability, and we know the pass rate, and the pass rate is 70%. So that is individual students' probability of success, which means that the probability of them failing the exam, unfortunately, is 1 minus the probability of success. Those two events are mutually exclusive, and those two events are the only two that populate the event space for a particular student. A particular student, when sitting in an exam, can either succeed or fail, at least in our simple design of, mo of a model. So we see that uh, an individual student's probability of failure, Q, is 0.3, or 30%. Straightforward enough, isn't it? Now we need to figure out how to model the probability of K students of passing the exam. For example, let's say K is equal to 7. We want to figure out how likely it is that out of 20 students, when individual pass rate is 70%, 7 students pass and 13 fail. And that is the essence of the probability mass function of the binomial distribution that we've got over here. So let's tackle it piece by piece. Well, obviously, if those events, passing or failing, are independent, student to student, then the probability that seven particular students will pass and 13 particular students would fail is p, the probability of individual success, raised to the power of k, so here we would have 0 0.7 to the power of 7, times the probability of individual failure, 0 0.3 in our case, raised to the power of the number of failures, 13 or 20 minus 7. k is equal to 7 in this case, reminding you of that. However, that is the probability of 7 particular students passing and 13 particular students failing. However, we can have all different arrangements. In our modeling, we do not necessarily care about which of our students pass and which fail. We only care about the total aggregated outcome. And for that, we need to use the and choose k function, which tells us how many times can you choose k elements out of n. How many ways are there to pick k succeeding students from the n total students? And that formula can be expanded mathematically using factorials. Consider this. We have got uh, 20 students, and we need to pick 7 succeeding students from the pool. Well, we have got 20 ways of picking our first lucky student, as we've got 20 in front of us. And then we pick our second succeeding student, and there are only 19 options left remaining, as the first lucky one is already gone from the pool. Their fate is already sealed. Then we are left with 18, and so on and so forth. So we'll be multiplying 20 by 19 by 18, and so on, in decreasing order, um, until we have selected 7 students. This particular decreasing uh, product of consecutive integers can be represented by n factorial divided by n minus k factorial, as 
14 times 15 times 16 times all the way up to 20. That is the uh, total amount that we can choose from. Can be represented more succinctly as 20 factorial divided by 13 factorial or 20 minus 7 factorial, isn't it? But then we have to consider the following. Uh, the total amount of ways how we picked uh, our seven succeeding students includes duplicates. We could have picked our seven students in any order. And how many ways are there to order our seven succeeding students? Well, k factorial or seven factorial in our case. And that completes our binomial distribution probability mass formula. We figure out how many ways there are to pick k succeeding students and then we multiply it onto the probability that k particular students would succeed and n minus k particular students would fail. So math out of the way, we can start implementing this in Excel using that direct translation of this formula into the language of Excel cell references. So let's roll. First of all, let's tackle the factorial bit. We take the factorial of our n number of trials and we need to lock the row here as n doesn't change, it is independent of k. Then we divide it by the product of two factorials in the denominator. The factorial of n minus k, n is locked regardless, and k is not. And then we multiply it by the factorial of k. k is the only parameter that we vary, so k is not locked and everything else is. And then we have dealt with the uh, n choose k bit, so only thing left remaining is to multiply by p, probability of individual success, raised to the power of k, the number of individual successes, times q, the probability of individual failure, raised to the power of n minus k, the number of individual failures. n is again locked, minus k, k still not locked. And now we can enforce this formula and see that fortunately, the probability of no students succeeding is very low. It's as low that we cannot see any significant digits here. However, if we expand this expression further and further and further, we can see that this probability is not zero. It's just astronomically small. Now, we can bottom right click this formula all the way down and figure out the probabilities of each of our 20 outcomes. We can see that, first of all, all of these 20 outcomes, their probabilities sum up to 100%, meaning that we haven't left any outcome remaining. The only likely outcomes are 0, 1, 2, all the way to 20. It can't be the case that out of 20 students that take the test, 21 pass it, isn't it? And obviously we can have negative numbers of students passing the test. That's also quite intuitive. Here, this 100% means that we haven't made any mistakes in our calculations, which is always a good sanity check for your binomial uh, distribution calculations. However, there is also a shortcut. There is a built-in Excel function that can be used to calculate the probability mass function of the binomial distribution. And this is binom.dist. Here, we need to select the number of successes, which is our k. We need to select the number of trials, which is our n, locked as usual the probability of success, which is our p, and then we need to specify whether we want the probability mass function or the cumulative distribution function. The cumulative distribution function is something that we'll cover next in a couple of minutes, and so far we are dealing with the probability mass function, the PMF, so we return zero. And that, as we want to make it all the way down, returns us exactly the same values. And we can visualize it by selecting those two columns and inserting a scatter with straight lines, we can look at which of the values, which of the um, number of passes is the most likely. And here we see that the peak of this probability mass function, the most likely outcome, is that 14 students exactly would pass. This outcome has a probability of 19.1639%, and we can verify it also looking at the table over here. So why is that? What is the most likely outcome and what is the average outcome? How many students, on average, um, are expected to pass the exam if there are 20 of them and each of them independently passes with a probability of 0.7? So let's calculate it uh, using a definitional formula and then 
explain how it can be simplified in terms of the parameters of our simulation, of our model. So, by definition, the expected value of passing students, the expected value of k, is the sum of weighted k's by their probabilities, by their probability mass functions. In Excel, we can implement that using a sum product function, referring to the column of k's and the column of probability mass functions. And we get 14. That is exactly the most likely outcome we observe on the graph and in the table. And uh, it's also the expected, the average outcome, turns out to be. But is it a coincidence? Turns out it's not. The general formula for the expected number of successes, expected k, is np, the number of trials, times the probability of individual success. And here we see that it can be generalized that if there are n students taking the test, each of them is expected to pass with a probability of 70%, then your average number of passing students is np, or in our case, 20 times 0 0.7 is 40. But there is more to it. If we calculate the variance of k, how variable, how volatile is the number of passing students, we can, first of all, use the definition, use the sum of weighted squared deviations from the expected value, so sum of k minus the expected k squared, and weighted by the expected probabilities, so probability mass functions. And we see that the variance of k is 4.2, meaning that the standard deviation of k is slightly in excess of 2. So on average, um, your number of passing students would deviate from 14 by approximately 2. So you would, on average, expect either 12 passing on the lower end and 16 passing on the higher end. However, there is also a succinct formula for the variance, and that's NPQ. So we basically just multiply number of trials times the probability of success times the probability of failure. And that gives us 4.2 exactly in this particular case. Now, we might also want to answer the question, not what is the likelihood, what is the probability of 10 students passing the exam. In that case, we can simply look it up and say that it's 3% quite unlikely that half of the students would fail, but also want to figure out what is the probability that less than or equal to 10 students pass the exam. And here is where cumulative distribution functions come into picture. The cumulative distribution function, by definition, in probability theory, is the function that shows you the probability that the random variable, in our case the number of passing students, would not exceed the value of the function, so would not exceed k. So, CDF, or cumulative distribution function, is exactly what we need for this particular purpose. So, for zero, as that's the lowest value, our CDF is just equal to our probability mass function. And then, as it's cumulative, we add on the values of the PMF for individual values. That is how CDF can be calculated for discrete random variables that can only take predetermined set of values that are not continuous. In our case, it can only be integers. One and a half students cannot pass, 7.5 students cannot fail, and so on. So as we have got predetermined set of values the variable can take is discrete, and we can use this particular approach to calculate the CDF. And enforcing it all the way down, we can see that the probability that 10 students or less would pass the exam is less than 5%. So, for example, an exam designer or someone who is responsible for carrying out the exam can look and say that if 10 students pass the exam at a particular year, then it's less than 5% chance likely this happened randomly. So perhaps the exam was too tough in this particular year, and uh, the tasks should be relaxed in the following year. Uh, alternatively, if, for example, out of uh, 20 students, 18 pass the exam, we can say that it's very unlikely that so many students pass the exam uh, given the expected value. And maybe uh, the exam needs to be uh, toughened up in next year, or maybe there was some collusion behind the students uh, during the exam and discipline needs to be enforced more strictly. So this is how uh, these types of statistics can be used in a very uh, understandable and very relatable setting to all of us. However, the final thing I wanted to show you is how to calculate CDF using the built-in Excel function. And obviously, to do that, we can simply change the zero in the 
binom test function while leaving everything else constant to a one that would return the CDF for the binomial distribution. And we see that for both our mathematical derivation and our Excel application, the values for PMF and CDF do not differ at all, uh, meaning that both ways are reliable techniques to implement PMF and CDF of the binomial distribution in Excel. And that's all there is about the binomial distribution and its practical applications. Please leave a like on this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, I'm eager to see any further suggestions for videos in business, finance, or economics you would like me to record. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel and send support on Patreon. Thank you very much, and stay tuned.